Good evening and welcome to the College of Town Crisis tonight. I uh, again want to bring the bring our college to order, please. I now came out. All right, we were we're trying to bring the college to order, please. I got a pension. All right. One more time. Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'll be acting as your moderator slash film videographer tonight. And I would like to uh, welcome everybody. There's only two brief rules here at the college. One is one fool at a time. The second one is no personal attacks. Oh, and that includes the waitress, so. All right, tonight we're having a strategic, we're having a speaker. She's a strategic intelligence analyst. Ellen Corley has, for the last 10 years, been applying her investigative journalist forensic historian methodology to investigating the question of why the U.S. legal system is not investigating the evidence of its own corrupt role in the way America has become a crypto-Nazi fascist state. Ellen argues we must find a way to denazify our deep state apparatus and what put into place by the fifth column of Nazi fascist jurists who were placed in positions of power to corrupt the U.S. state by Carl Schmidt, a conservative German legal, constitutional, and political theorist. Ellen argues that Schmidt has done to the U.S. what he did to Hitler's Germany, which is what he first, what he used operatives to securely put into American law, acts like the National Security Act, the National Security Restoration Act, the Patriot Act, and systematically enable all branches of government to get away with using completely corrupt means to achieve its completely corrupt ends. Wow, that's a mouthful. Let's give a rousing round of applause for our speaker tonight. Ellen, come on up and uh, let's go. This is her first speech here, folks, so give her a little credit. Come on up. Thank you. No. Okay. So, uh. Oh, be nice to her. Yeah. Yeah, bear with me, uh, guys. No way. <laughs> All right. So, uh, yeah, I'm Ellen Corley. Um, I started coming here about a year ago. I've uh, made a few retorts, but this is the first time I've talked. Um, I love, as I always say, I love this free speech idea. I learned it from Doug and Don. I'd run into them at the uh, United for Democracy now. And... Um, you know, they told me about it, and I'm like, perfect, because uh, I basically am, I call myself an adult child of a Republican family, you know, I uh, was raised on one half in the South by a, by a Rush Limbaugh family, and on the other by a Milton Friedman, Alan Greenspan uh, type family, so I was pretty much brainwashed um, growing up, you know. Uh, Luckily, actually, you know, I started off in Georgia. I think I got a good exposure to to good values um, through, you know, the church and a good family. Um, so, you know, but I, I really wanted Kennedy to win. I remember back in, you know, I was born in 55, so we were actively fighting for Kennedy uh, versus Nixon back then and it's but it's actually it's kind of ironic it was always a tricky deal in that um, they paid me to, they said we'll dress you up and if you will go with Nixon you know betray your real values you know ask not what your country can do for you ask what you could do for your country and um, you know, if you vote for Nixon or stand for him we'll give you a parade well, anyhow, my brother pulled me down and yelled at me, and I realized that was the wrong thing to do. And uh, anyhow, I, I think in my heart I'm a true Kennedy Democrat. Uh, but then when I, we moved to New York, my stepfather, an Ayn Rand person, said, you know, um, that's communism, you know, to ask what you do for your country. 
So I was always basically kind of confused, um, you know, uh, right? So anyhow, that's why, you know, here I am. The topic I picked to talk about is something that basically starting 10 years ago, my stepfather got pulled away by a Tea Party Trump uh, pundit. And I, you know, Fox News paid liar. And, and all of a sudden things started to make sense. I realized that this vast right wing conspiracy really is an evil vast right wing conspiracy. And, uh, you know, I started looking into who this woman was. She was the Lieutenant Governor of New York that took my stepfather and our entire estate. And um, I, my feeling was it's like, it's like the way I saw the movie The Winds of War, the Jewish family must have felt like, what happened? They took my house, they took my father, they just, you know, because you're the Jews, they take it. And I realized this is fascism, right? This is, um, this is what it feels like, and I just kept digging into it. And I realized that um, it's true that uh, the, the philosophy, the legal philosophy that is behind Ayn Rand and the neocons and the neoliberals and uh, Trump and Bush and uh, and actually probably Clinton's, you know, this group, especially since 1990 uh, when the supposed fall of the Russian state, this is um, basically the neocons are an extension of this Carl Schmitt way of thinking. Okay, so Carl Schmitt, I mean, I've heard of him, was uh, Lee, you know, known as Hitler's crown jurist, right? And what, the more you read of this conspiracy theory about, you realize that it was people like, you know, people say, if I could go back and kill Hitler, everything would be all right, you know? It's like, no, because the real <coughs> evil was people like Carl Schmitt, the legal and our own bankers and our own CIA and our, the OSS that was funding Hitler, right? And then he's the legal philosopher behind Hitler. So, you know, all you, you realize if you look back on where does this evil Machiavellian, the state is, is uh, you know, dictatorial, totalitarian, fascist, state and the role of the government is to protect itself, that that goes back to people like Carl Schmidt who inserted it. We thought we won World War II, but actually we funded it and um, and their their secret fifth column of, of jurists and of bankers and secret police and our military industrial complex and our security state is still embedded. It's just gone underground into the deep state, right? It's, that's what they call the deep state. Uh, the, and um, the frustrating thing is that now you hear about the deep state and really what we're, it's the media, the way the media deals with like, like, oh, Donald Trump will stand up to the deep state. Uh, Donald Trump is the puppet of the deep state, just as Hillary Clinton was. But um, so, you know, we the deep state is there, it's been there, and the question is, how are we going to get rid of them? How are we going to stand up to them? Especially since, uh, you know, our politicians don't talk about it, the media doesn't talk about it, the school curriculum doesn't talk about it. Uh, Luckily, we've got this forum where we are talking about it occasionally. Um, it, it basically, a lot of, I know we've got some socialists here, or some lefties, and some proud conspiracy theorists like myself and, and Andy and uh, some others. Right, good, Tom. And, um, you know, it's the truth about the conspiracy theory is. It was, as a term, it was invented by the CIA. It was, you know, basically the OSS, a, a kind of secret police me mechanism to, to give themselves plausible deniability for if ever asked, you know, did you, 
it looks like the evidence shows that you're the one that killed JFK. You're the one that killed Martin Luther King. You're the one that um, pulled, you know, helped pull down 9/11. You know, pull down the the twin towers. They say, oh, uh, that's a conspiracy theory. You don't believe that, right? And they they give themselves the right to deny what they are doing. And, and so. Um, it's interesting. Last night I'm watching Webster talk, Lee's talks that most of us, I wish I could have just played that here. He is a lot more, a much better speaker than I am. But he, you know, started it with a picture of Carl Schmidt and Leo Strauss and um, Heidegger. These, um, there's a direct connection between 9 11, the fact that we let it happen, made it happen. Uh, you know, and if we would get ourselves to talk about it and admit it, we uh, we have a chance of addressing it. You know, but the problem is, the it's awkward to be the only one in the room that is mentioning it. You know, bringing it up at church, bringing it up. You know, I, I was so grateful the first time I came here. I brought it up. Ted was talking, and I'm like. What do you think about 9-11? And finally, in a free speech forum, you know, people, it's like, yeah, right, it probably did happen. You know, it did, right? We can actually get beyond this feeling like, is it, you know, my own lion eyes, or am I seeing what I'm seeing, right? And that's, there's, that's the way conspiracy, I mean, the, the evil of this deep state that, you know, pretends it's not a deep state and talks about itself as if, you know, the deep state is something other than what it is, you know, not them, but you know, not the right wing, but the left wing, you know, not the fascist, but the communists or the socialists. Basically, there's been a war by the fascists against the socialists, by the state against the people, by the bankers against the poor people, against the blacks, the Muslims, the the women, the old people, the disabled people, the gay people, anybody's different. They, you know, there's a war, and but they're now getting away with it because they um, they pretend there is no war. They just oh, this is a free market. It's um, you know we we need right now if we had free speech. You'd have a socialist here talking against the fascists, you know, on the debates on CNN. We, you know, the Bernie would be there, you know, arguing against Trump, and we wouldn't have Trump, right? Um, this, you know, using our state to wage war, genocide against the against the Iranians, against the North Koreans, against the. Ukrainians or the Russians, uh, you know, this this is this old Nazi trick of, okay, of blaming things on the Russians, the Cold War idea, right? This is what Carl Schmitt taught us to do. He was the one who came, came up with the idea of, oh, the Reichstag fire <coughs> Burn down, let's blame the communists, okay? Let's suspend all our rights because, you know, the bunk that happened. Same thing happened with 9-11. With, uh, oh yeah, some, supposedly some, you know, Islamist terrorist burned, took down 9-11. It's, it's implausible and it, it couldn't have happened and it didn't happen, but they, uh, you know, they can use that to suspend our rights, right? Our, our, our rights to, this, it gives the state the right to wage forever war, costing trillions of dollars on, and committing genocide on the world, in our name, with our money, you know, closing our schools, taking away our health care, taking away our clean water, clean air rights, they just, let's take all our trillions and just keep genociding Malaysia and, you know, and all these other countries. This is, and, and not, nobody even talks about it. The media just keeps getting dumber and it gets harder to find these other people. Yeah? How are we genociding Malaysia? Malaysian? 
And there's in Indonesia, you know, these, I don't know, is it Malaysia or the Rafidis that are getting genocided? Myanmar. And, Myanmar. Myanmar. I'm sorry, Myanmar. Yeah, that, um, yeah. Why are we doing it? Let's get to the speech and then we'll get to the questions afterwards if you don't mind. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anyhow, I am, I'm kind of going all over the place. I, I wrote all this stuff down, uh, but I can't even read my writing <laughs> to tell you the truth. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, the, you know, the point I guess I was trying to make in this, this what I wrote down, was, uh, you know, it, I, I did learn a little bit as a community organizer in the last few years. You know, first I realized that I could see this evil, but I don't know what to do with it. And so I got involved with Obama's Organizing for Action and then the Alliance Against Racist Political Oppression and Refuse Fascism and coming to this group. And I'm interested in the Jane Addams group, uh, you know, that we really have to, we have to organize, we have to talk, we have to practice speaking up. You know, there you can be online and uh, trying to share ideas on Facebook, and and um, I really ex have a strong sense that uh, I'm getting kind of trolled, and you know, um, the ideas. There's a censorship phenomena that goes on that um, you know is not unlike George Orwell's Big Brother. You know what really happened under fascists. Germany, you know, you're like, where was, I mean, you knew that they wrote their, uh, that the media and their control of the media, the propaganda, the big lies, this was all part of how they were able to take over. But you're like, is this happening? I mean, it's very hard to get even a lot of people to admit that this is Nazi fascism here in America, you know, because it's like, well, it doesn't look you know, I don't see books burning, and I don't see um, a lot of this. But the truth is, we—I don't think we saw it back then. You know, I—I I recently watched this Marcelo Pool's *The Sorrow and the Pity*. You know, where he's talking to people that were Nazi Germans in during the Hitler time, and you know, they're—they still, you know, aren't admitting. That there was anything wrong with what they did you know there still is a a kind of a, like we need to denazify you know but people you can't denazify something if you don't admit it's nazified right we um we're right we we don't see it right we're um it's i actually got that message from mark crispin miller as a a really great writer. Uh, he's a professor at NYU. On um, who came here to Chicago last summer, t talking about election integrity and propaganda. He's very aware that you know elections are rigged and um, you know and free speech is modified. And he had written you know something. I copy him on Facebook, and he said, uh, you know, why don't you write about denazifying? the Chicago Police Department. And uh, I'm like, how am I gonna do that? You know, I mean, nobody even knows that it is nazi fight. But, uh, you know, it's, um, more gets revealed. You know, we we went and saw him last summer. Doug was there, you know. Uh, there's a lot of evidence, you know, talking about the elections <laughs> rigged. And, but what really surprised me was he said there that, you know, he just, as soon as he started talking about conspiracy theorists, and, and I know he actually led a talk in New York about 9-11, he comes home one day and his computer's gone and his telephone's gone. You know, that's, that's how secret police Gestapo works. You know, you don't know, but, you know, until you're kind of being silenced. And uh, recently, I don't know if Andy knows anything about this, but, uh, Jim Mars, uh, a great investigative writer, wrote well, The Rise of the Fourth Reich, and um, I didn't realize how credible he was till I saw him speak recently. 
on TV, you know, on YouTube. I mean, he's a font of knowledge about for the last 40 years investigating the Kennedy assassination and things. He he's just telling the facts. But recently, I don't know. He's dead. You know, a lot of times you follow somebody like this, and why are they suddenly dead? You know, I, you know, it's um, it it seems to happen a lot more than we like to admit that these heart attacks seem to be afflicting people that are speaking up and out, you know, and um, and you you know you realize there is a there is a little Nazi deep state there underneath it all, um, but there is I think some safety or some hope at least in in knowing that there's groups like this. Uh, I, I really think we have to, you know, embrace the socialist organizations, oh ourselves as socialists, um, because the fact that I even have a hard time saying I'm a socialist or a communist or an anarchist, I don't, it, you know, it doesn't matter, but um, there is this, like, you won't get a job if you say that, right? There is this little cultural norm that uh, makes it a little bit scary to uh, to be not you know not like I'm one of the I'm a Nazi too you know <laughs> right I used to joke I was like growing up a uh, a lamb in wolves clothing you know I can swim with the sharks right I you know uh, because that's what you have to do with capitalism and it it really is hard to say I am anti-capitalist, uh, but the more research you do, you uh, realize that um, capitalists and democracy are two different things. And um, capitalism is basically uh, like what fascism is, really, is the capitalists have taken over the state. And they, uh, right, or as... Um, that's my friend Jeff uh, that's, came up with this quote. Uh, Capitalism is the astounding belief that the most wickedest of men will do the wickedest of things for the greatest good of everyone. But um, by John Maynard Keynes, you know, um, it's it's kind of funny because you know my stepfather was a Milton Friedman, Ayn Rand, Alan Greenspan cult member, and uh, they actually you know, spent all their intellectual propaganda fighting against the Keynes, right? It's like either you're one or the other, and it's if, and what I've come to realize is Anthony Sutton revealed this, that, you know, that the um, Rothschild bankers, they're funding both sides of these false arguments, you know, the, here's what a Democrat says, here's what a Republican, here's the Shia, here's the Sunni. Right, here's the communist, here's the nationalist. And they win both ways. They he has evidence they were behind you know, the Vietnam the communists and and the you know, whatever the you know we were fighting for. And um, I guess that is one so what are the solutions? And some of the ideas I have are I'd like to go to the Supreme Court and get a case that they don't we need to protect the rights of communists. You can't just wage a war on a country because they're communists, right? That's like waging a war because they're Muslim, you know, or waging a war because, I mean, don't we have freedom of religion? The First Amendment has got to be protected. It's got to stand for something. And it, politics, religion, science, philosophy, whatever you are, you know, it, it, you should have the freedom to not be murdered by the state for that belief, right? That's that's the core right that needs to be needs to be gotten to. And it, so I guess you know the other. That's why it, I just keep coming back to Carl Schmidt because he, if you look back on history, there's always a. You know, Thomas Jefferson was against the Federalist. You know, there was always this dynamic like, I'm for the people and they're for the state. And you've got to stand up against this state to t tyranny, right? And um, John Dewey was facing uh, Lippmann, you know, and all the elitists that were censoring 
this, they're like, let's just tell the people what to think rather than let the people think and talk and, and you know, have their own issues talked about freely, right? That's, it's always going to be that dynamic. They'll say, oh, it's left and right, elections have consequences, so now we get to do whatever we want. No, that we have got to recognize that this is tyranny, this is exactly what we need to stand up against and we need to talk against because frankly it if we and we need to also get the media there was a fairness doctrine that they threw out in the 80s under Reagan they said oh there used to be a rule that the media the broadcasters responsible for having a, a fair public you know discussion you can't just use the media for propaganda like Fox News is doing so basically, Fox News got that thrown out. Now they're like, oh, free speech. We can just lie and make up all this stuff about, you know, Hillary or whatever, and, you know, let, let hate speech reign freely. That, we, the reason they had a fairness doctrine, I'm going to be looking into this, is because they knew the Ku Klux Klan was using the broadcast media to organize rallies. And they said, there's a simple way to stop hate speech. Put the burden on the owner of the broadcast station, say you use it for that, you lose your right to broadcast. You know, sorry, you know, Rupert Murdoch, you lost your right to broadcast, right? Because you're using it for propaganda. You're using it, you know, to cover up your own evil tyranny. <laughs> so, um, anyhow, that's it. I look forward to hearing your opinions too. Mm -hmm. I have questions for the mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I'd just like to ask. Uh, Tim, yeah. You know, you grew up in a Republican family. You know, Milton Friedman. You know, things. What was there like a specific time or place that kind of started you going down the liberal path? And can you tell us a little bit about what was it that caused the change in your viewpoints over time? Right, yeah, good question. Um, because my. Can you repeat the question? Oh, yeah. The question, he said, I grew up in a liberal, in a, in a conservative family. My stepfather was friends with Milton Friedman and Alan Greenspan and Ayn Rand. And when did I change and start turning liberal, left wing in my thinking? And it was when my stepfather was kind of taken hostage by a Tea Party sweetheart scam that was, she was a Republican Party sweetheart scam. And um, so that was kind of a shock. Up until then, I had always just kind of tried to please him. I tried to be, you know, I was like, I always said I ended up being a Republican because I could never win an argument against him, you know. Um, right, it was just, you know, uh, always trying, you know, what about the Vietnam War? He'd say, oh, it'll be a bloodbath. You know, it was just always a one-sided argument. Um, and so I would usually just kind of fall. And uh, But also, growing up, it, then I moved to Georgia, back to Georgia. He lives in New York. And in Georgia, I don't think we get the media there. So I didn't, I studied, I mean, I don't know, we, yeah. we didn't get the NPR like we get it up here, you know, right? We, it's it really, they do kind of control it down there. So it was just all music and, you know, um, other stuff on there, right? So, um, but the, what? They, but anyhow, uh, but I did, had studied it in school there, but I didn't really understand it really until I came here and you, you get screwed by them, and um, and then you start doing research, and I think I eventually, uh, you know, I guess I overcame my own brainwashing, you know, that realizing that um, I, you know, became open to really all these ideas. When I came here, I really was like, why am I coming here? I don't even, I didn't know anything good about Lincoln. I was like, I'd never heard anybody say anything good about Lincoln in my whole life, you know? Um, really, I, you know? <laughs> really, and then somebody said, you should be a civil rights lawyer. I'm like, I don't need civil rights, I'm white, right? You know, what? I'm, <laughs> it was kind of, it's weird, but you just don't hear it. You're in a bubble, you know, um, right? You just don't ever see, 
the other side. And I, I do think it's off a big matter of empathy, you know, that, um, and actually I thought about selling the idea, dear white people, but we, uh, you realize that we, you know, we, I, we don't identify with the other, you know, with, with the plight of, of the blacks or, you know, you, you, I mean, I worked with them, I was a teacher, I understood it, but um, I didn't really get it because I don't think you understand what rights are until you've had yours taken away. That's what happened. Mm -hmm. All right, Jane. Uh, uh -huh. I was going to ask you about what some books, but I'm intrigued. What is a sweetheart stamp? Yeah. I don't know what that is. Yeah, it's a it's an old Nazi Soviet trick, or you know that they use in the military psychological operations. They blackmail a guy, you know, by putting a little bimbo, getting him in bed, you know, and then filming it and blackmailing him and all of that. But in his case, they call it, he's an elder, an elder fraud. It's a big major type of elder fraud where a, a young woman takes an older married man who's too demented to say no and says, oh, we're getting married. And uh, give me all your wife's money and all your kids' inheritance and uh, you're with me. And he too, too out of it to even know what happened. And there's no law against it, as long as she's got a better, more corrupt lawyer to, uh, to stand with her. Thank you. Okay. Say that again, because I didn't quite do Sweetheart something? A sweetheart scam? Scam. Right, it's an elder got it. fraud. Okay. Elder financial exploitation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which one? It, it, it seems to me that the left wing is consistently attacking the right wing. They have, with the media, with the protesters, the way they attack Trump. And you're saying that the right wing is attacking the left wing? I can't see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know. I, I noticed. Yeah. I, it's, I don't know. I, for a long time, I did used to. Like, it's like, what, what is your antenna picking up? And I often did think, oh, they're always blaming everything on business. And I, I really thought that it was kind of unfair that when I was on the right wing, I thought the left wing was making stuff up. And then I, I'm like a fact checker. The more I check these facts, I realize there's a lot more, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire, and really, you know, what gets it is when your own state is murdering Martin Luther King and murdering JFK. I mean, you research any of these things, why didn't they investigate that? They did 9-11. They don't investigate themselves because they're corrupt. The CIA, the Justice Department, the FBI, the, you know, the police, they're torturing people here in Chicago. And, um, you know, to me, that's, that's, right wing, you know, when the state corporate is uh, murdering people and covering it up and uh, not even taking the case or letting the people out of jail, that's that's a very right wing extremist Nazi kind of okay. thing. Who's uh Okay, yeah. Which one? Uh, on that fairness doctrine, the fairness doctrine was gotten rid of 10 years before Fox News. Oh yeah. Yeah, well no, but Fox News was behind the scenes, uh, you know, no, building their empire. Well, no, they, they, but Rupert Murdoch was. Rupert Murdoch had a newspaper empire, and he is in, he was in Australia and England, right? And so a lot of what they're getting away with is, um, I mean, see, he's a part of the Manhattan Institute, as my stepfather was, and that's how they got my stepfather, you know, with this sweetheart scam. It's, it's like, it is a CIA front organization started by William Casey, who was also the, the Nixon's, um, Nixon and Reagan's, you know, CIA, Republican Party. Well, he was a CIA Chief. under Reagan. Right. So Casey, yeah. William Casey. He was, he was his campaign organizer, a CIA guy, yeah. and he started the Manhattan Institute, and he took over ABC News. So you see the CIA has been buying up the media, the capital cities, we don't know about it, but they, they brought down ABC and then bought it, and this way they control them. So these are, this is a kind of trick, right, of the CIA and the media that should be kept very separate, but they really are front groups. All these think tanks are, are like that, and they keep it out of the news so we don't hear about it. 
Right. When they got rid of the fairness doctrine, that's what made it possible for Rush Limbaugh to start up. Right. Yes, and he had a big wanted. part in that. And he okay. still, they used to talk about restoring it. And Rush Limbaugh would go around asking Nancy Pelosi, should we put the fairness doctrine back? And she's like, well, I heard they were going to do something like that. And he, but they never, it never built up, you know. Um, and that was first started under ABC Capital Cities. It was on the radio. And okay. Yeah, okay, was it? Yeah, yeah. yeah WABC in New York, York was owned by ABC. So okay, same yeah. As WLS. There's a great book about that. Um, yeah, that called, um, you know, uh, Venus Mazzotto or something, you know, so, but it's a very interesting. To me, the media and the way the media is owned and therefore not fair and balanced is a really big issue that, okay. that we need to restore, and it, it's, it's tricky. That's a big issue. Uh -huh. Okay. Who's our next questionnaire? Okay, and there's another question. Uh -huh. I wish that you could um, describe more of the state-state organization, the hierarchy, the, um, who's, who's running it. Is it Say it again. I'm sorry. What'd you say? What's I, I wish you could describe this organization who's really the, the string master, who's pulling the strings, who's getting the Democrats to fight the Republicans as she is, who to fight the to, to right. raise the uh, people in Myanmar to persecute the Rohingya. Right. Who's in charge? Is there a yeah. structure? Is there a yeah. charter? Is there a, a document? I keep reading about it, and what I've, my, hypothesis is uh, that seems to hold true is that it's the the Rothschild it goes back to the banking the really the most obvious is Warburg and um, the people who took over our Federal Reserve Bank in in 1913 um, JP Morgan Warburg Paul Warburg right and um, and the yeah, J.P. Morgan, Warburg, <coughs> Rockefeller, uh, the people representing their interests, they really own the America. They own our treasury. They, you know, they have total control. And um, so that, and also with the military, you know, those guys are the ones that funded Hitler. Um, the, you know, Ford, we don't realize that Auschwitz was a Ford plant or with the Zycon B, all these were, you know, the big DuPont and um, the, our, all the top corporate players in our in our stock market were all are all there because they are, you know, the stock market funded by these bankers. And so it's, it's really the arms trade, the, you know, um, the pharmaceuticals. I mean, we don't realize that our government is is the reason we needed to kill Kennedy to, is because they always want to go to war, right? And he was about to institute peace. He was about to get rid of them as the dollar, right? He, um, and so we wanted the, this, these guys um, wanted to go to Vietnam to upgrade that because there was a, an open trade in, in Laos or whatever, you know, that they were very much involved in it, pushing the opium and the um, arms trade and everything and that see they make money on both sides they they create the crime and then they create the police to fight the crime right we we've, we've got police here and FBI people here who understand that there's a lot of jobs you know in both sides of this okay so, any other who's uh, next Doug? Hey, yeah Ellen. yeah how do these uh, modern fascists uh, like the Koch brothers and uh, the Mercers uh, fit in with this? Are they part of it or are they just separate one-offs? Yeah, no, I think they're very integral to it. I, I, you know, and you, we have to keep looking into that, but um, actually I read, you know, years back, my stepfather was there with the Koch brothers uh, and, uh, you know, at a lunch, you know, planning, this is 10 years ago, putting in with Mike Pence. You know, they, they were, they develop all these, these, we think it's a, an independently developed bunch of, you know, candidates we have in our elections, but they're all 
bought and paid for by the by the big bankers and the billionaires and it and their their money comes from the Koch brothers you know even their father was in Stalinist uh, Stalin Russia right and um, I I do think there's a, he was also the founder of the John Birch Society um, you know all you have to do is turn over the rock and there's a lot of connections going straight back to to Nazi Germany and um, that's how they got their billions the William Scaife uh, you know and Olin and, and the Olin Foundation all these front groups are like the Koch's brothers um, you know are they, they were probably you know they would be very prominent in the deep state, you know, and they also create all this legislation with Alec, and so uh, and they, you know, created the Trump debacle we've got now, so that they can get their kickbacks through this tax plan, 1.5 trillion dollar tax plan, and they don't have any more regulations on their, you know, taking up out the Arctic now, you know, that this is why they they have to put in people like him. Yeah. All right. I'm just going to make it real brief. If we're so what? bad. And Wait, I, I, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. I'm him. sorry. Yeah. yeah. My okay. apologies. Who's a question? Wait, Charlie. Yeah. Ellen, I thought the deep state were these federal federal employees uh, who uh, didn't want to go along with Trump. Uh, a notion of uh, make America great again. And so I said he's got to drain the swamp. And that's why they're coming up with all the stuff that yeah, he, that's, he's that's, a colluder and he's crazy and a child. And I don't. That's what stuff. like Alex Jones, you know, uh, puts out there. I think the right wing propaganda machine puts it out there that uh, that's that's a frustrating thing that um, that that's what the deep state, you know, is just trying to take down poor Trump, you know. Um, you know, yeah. blame it on the Russians, like we're making this stuff up. And uh, that's not really what the deep state was, but it, it just shows how Fox News and Alex Jones and these right-wing media machine, you know, Rush Limbaugh, can change the narrative. And actually, that's an issue that I, I really gets back to revisionist history. They are changing our narrative, our history. They, they you know, uh, just making it so that we're all, you know, confused, right? That they the different set of facts to the extent that this is what they define the deep state is. Or it seems like, you know, they come up with the names of people like John O'Neill, you know, or he's the one that they killed in the World Trade Center, but also he's over here. They they keep picking up people with the same names. So uh, it's um it's really difficult to separate the truth from the fake news, uh, you know, and it, but it all lends itself, sadly, I think, to a, I, we've got to revise, I think we should have the right to, to the truth and the, um, about history. And it, this is where they use the Southern evangelists, evangelists in a scary way that they, you know, um, I went down to Georgia telling my parents this, and my my Baptist stepmother is like, "Well, I don't care if she, you know, is communist as long as she doesn't try to convert me to communism." And it, you know, she really thinks that that's what I'm doing. I'm just trying to get the truth out there. I don't care. It shouldn't be right wing or left wing. You know, the truth should be the truth. You know, who's killing who? Scientifically, you know, why are we still murdering a lot of people? <laughs> around the world. Who's behind this torture? Um, coup d'etats, you know, this Casey that my stepfather knew, I wouldn't, otherwise I wouldn't have known about this, was the one, you know, Iran-Contra organized and he did the, um, the overthrew the Mossadegh in Iran, you know, and this is, this was a democratically elected guy and they're like, okay, well, they want to nationalize their oil and BP, you know, wants the oil, so uh, let's overthrow him. You know, and that's what they've done in Chile and Argentina and everywhere they go. They they take over a country, kill the liberals, you know, and take it over with the soldiers, torture the liberals, and um, and then take all their oil, you know. And 
<clears throat> so now you go to Venezuela and they go, oh, the oil's cheap, but we're starving. You know, and this is where the uh, World Bank and the IMF, they, this is how their, this guy Perkins wrote about this. Um, you know, the confessions of an economic hitman. We go to a country, we force them into debt, they can't pay it, you know, and people start starving. If we're, capitalism is an evil force, that's the truth. Mm -hmm. Okay. The uh, Bilderberg group, you heard of them, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're a very rich, liberal group uh, uh, nation uh, around the world, but they're trying to take over the whole world and control the whole world, but they must get rid of the American middle class first. And that's one reason why they bring in all these uh, immigrants and everything. They're trying to poverty, to make the United States poverty. Get our middle class has shrunk, and uh, once it shrinks, they can take over, right? I don't. I don't agree with that. I. I think that. I think the Bilderbergs is kind of the left wing group that you know. I think these guys kind of go, okay, here's your ones that supposedly influence Jimmy Carter, and you know, I, I don't think they're a force for good, but I. I don't, you know, think they're quite as bad as this, um, the right wing, the World Anti-Communist League and the, um, the other, actually it's the Knights of Malta are the ones that, the right wing group that, um, that seems to identify this guy Singlob, these are militarist types, whereas the Bilderbergs, Jimmy Carter, Hillary Clinton and those people, they're, they're, you know, a little bit corrupted. I mean, I mean, Brzezinski obviously had a bad influence on on Carter, but other, I don't think you can blame that on Carter. He was, and he's still, Carter is still trying to, you know, all he wanted was peace between um, between uh, Israel. Uh, I do blame a lot on the Zionist um, influence on things, you know. It, it really comes down to militarization versus the people, you know, and, um, you know, these economics, Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so how do you feel that we should uh, go about uh, solving this problem? Do you believe our traditional electoral politics in this country will ever solve it? Or if not, how do we go about solving it? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Uh, I think that we, we could solve it if we had the media. I'm, like Tom, Thomas Jefferson said that, we need to have a, a a fair and balanced, honest, even playing field when it comes to the media. And it, all these, the regulation, you know, we need, uh, the one thing I know about the right wing from my stepfather is they want to throw out regulation, like it's always bad. But it, it, we need right regulation, right? And so if the, the media was regulated, just put the burden on the owner of the TV station or the publisher to not have little moles in there misrepresenting things. Make sure the editors and the publishers, you know, are covering the news. I, I actually have a, a news, the New York Times going back, the front page, and I open it up, and it was like during World War II, they, it was on the front page. They were, Uruguay, you know, says that there's a fifth column of Nazis coming into them from Brazil. You know, it was right on the front page. Now you wouldn't see that, you know. They don't. They don't ever. You never see the word fascism. You never hear the word corruption. You never. I, yeah, I don't know. You only get. It's almost like it really is an organ of the CIA that really is. You know, let's just pit Hillary versus him. You know, and either way, the people lose. It's the issues they need to focus on, not this. You know, it's not a ball game. You know, or a popularity contest or. It's, it's fake, it really is. <laughs> okay. Uh, you, you know what, I'm sorry, can you explain me one thing with your stepfather mm -hmm. and how is it uh, connected? I know you explained it. Yeah. yeah, the stepfather. It, but, it's connections to Washington or yeah. DC. Okay, he was, Just briefly, you know. yeah, sure. He was, um, he died last year, but he, um, before, he was a head of Oppenheimer, a research analyst. Um, looking back, I don't know much about what happened to him, but he was born in 1930 and showed up in Pelham. 
and J.P. Morgan. So I don't know. I would I wouldn't be surprised. Wall Street guy. Yeah, you know, but a lot of these, I don't know if you realize, thousands of Nazis were brought in and put into J.P. Morgan, you know, and all over the country, war criminals from Germany. So I know he came from Germany and, you know, kind of already plugged into the real estate market. And so I know he went, you know, he went to Korea. He ended up at Columbia, Amherst, and um, friends of Ayn Rand's managing her books. So I... I look in Alan Greenspan, the head of the Federal Reserve, and so it just, he already knew all these people, and he, so I would always just listen, you know, but he, um, I, only in hindsight do I now look back and wonder about the, you know, the Nazi connections there, the, you know, the financial connections, like when I mentioned, he was head of Oppenheimer Capital, Oppenheimer, head of research, but, you know, not a bad guy in himself. I wouldn't have thought, oh, Nazi fascist. He actually, though, said, later he goes, people call us Nazis, right? And I'm like, wow, that's weird. Why would they call you fascist? And he's like, I don't know. But then he'd be talking to the William Buckley types, and he's like, you know, she's not one of us, you know? I mean, there were these strange little cult-like things. And he was so involved with the Manhattan Institute which is widely known to be a front group for the CIA, just like the Ford Foundation and... Um, you know, he married somebody? And so he married my mother, you know, but, but in 1965, <laughs> moved us to New York. <laughs> but, but then this woman took him away uh, in 2007. The Lieutenant Governor of New York, Betsy McCoy, he got on her board. My mother had Alzheimer's starting in 95, and so he slipped in and she got in involved with him and um, ended up then all of a sudden he's leaving he's taking my mother's house and everything with him to buy you know million dollar house with for this woman there's a, a, a woman her name was Betsy McCoy she was lieutenant governor of New York a Republican no it's important yeah this is the whole reason she's doing this no. Okay, so she was she was a Tea Party Republican, Lieutenant Governor of New York under Pataki, crazy as a loon, and she basically is paid by the by the these people, the Republican Party, to make up lies about the health care system. That's that's why they thought she was so great. She, they published fake news in 1994 about the Hillary health care plan, right? So there's a lot of paid pundits like the Fox News. She would show up every day on Fox News. I wake up, well, she's on BBC after Trump got elected going, here I am, Dr. Betsy McCoy. I mean, you know, and talking about the economy. She didn't know about the economy, you know, uh, right? She was studied history. She, but she's a paid pundit, just like Fox News are paid Republican Party pundits. That's why they don't say anything bad about Donald Trump. That's why they're not saying anything bad about anybody right now, because they're afraid Fox News will go after them. See, it's a, it's a machine, right, of, um, of influence where the liars and the propagandists okay. are writing the show, okay? And he, he got sucked into it. I think he, he, if he had his wits about him before he died, he wouldn't have gotten sucked into it. So that is, I was trying to show him the truth, and she wouldn't even let me see him for the last three years of his life. <laughs> and now I'm still trying to sue, I'd like to sue, you know, and challenge the will that left everything to her and the Manhattan Institute rather than his children. Yeah, he had some money. He had twenty million dollars, yeah, that he left to this woman. And let me not zero. Nothing. Okay, so that's how you learn. He is part of the deep state. That's that's how you learn, Charlie. Personal okay. life. It's no. Not even so personal questions. This is not personal. This is political. And when the personal got political, that's how I got woke. That's the problem. Charlie, we wait. It's a free speech forum. It's a free speech forum. We, we've not no, heard this rule. She's also it's a political question. She's it's also considered to answer it. So shut up. All right.
Okay, yeah, another question over there. Uh -huh. All right. Let's cut the order, please. Would you be able to briefly explain um, 9-11, who was behind it, and were there actual airplanes that flew into the World Trade Center? Yeah, good question. Because <laughs> I have researched this, and it's all connected. Because if we could tell the truth about everything, I think we that's what we need. And uh so I'm a truther uh, in general, and I would say that I was studying Webster Tarpley last night, and uh, I know that it wasn't a plane that went into the Pentagon because it's, it's too big and the hole's too small, right? Um, I, at the Pentagon, right? This great big plane couldn't have gone into that little bitty hole, right? And so I do think. Uh, I just I keep listening, but it does seem like there it was blown up. Okay. Maybe a plane went into it, but it. Um, I think what the experts say is that uh, somebody made it happen, and um, right, and they don't. It had to have been blown up. You know, it couldn't have come down like that without with just a plane. Could, were there two airplanes that flew into the World Trade Center on 9/11? I, somebody else might be able to answer that. I don't. I, it seems to me that maybe they did, maybe they didn't. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. And, and who architected or who was the real person behind it? Or a group behind it? There's, it seems like that it was a. Um, what he was saying is this military operation. This Webster Tarpley has a great book on that. There's a lot of drills going on that day. And so all those drills, the way they work, you know, military drills with STRATCOM and all these millions of intelligence groups. They they had all like 17 drills going that day, and the way they do it is, and then all of a sudden it's real. And they're like, wait a minute, we thought that was just a drill, but meanwhile they had all their planes somewhere else, and a lot of people thought it was a drill, and and then they're like. Oh, it, it really happened. So this is how it gets pulled up. But somebody like Cheney probably, I think, was behind it personally. You know, but, um, you know, and a lot of uh, powerful. I think also the, the um, Netanyahu, the people who wrote the project for the New America Century, you know, they had written, we need something like a new Pearl Harbor so that we can take over the world for our new world order, right? And so the Bush family, all of this is all connected to that. Okay. What about that third plane over Pennsylvania? The one that yeah. The passenger brought it down. Right. But it's so, the hole is so little there in Pennsylvania, you're like, where'd it go? So um, there's something funny with the story, but they, Webster Tarpley, I said last night that he thought it was supposed to come back and knock out the White House, which, which they probably would have done that. Yeah, you know, that makes a big impression. And then they go to war forever and... And we think it's justified because they can blame it. See, this false flag idea is really key. They're, all of our wars are start with a false flag. You know, so somehow Pearl Harbor, the Liberty, the Gulf of Tonkin got in Vietnam. They staged something and then they, um, and they're like, oh, now we've got to go to war because they did it to us. And that's what we really have to shine a light on that. Actually, I was online when they were trying to throw a coup in Turkey, and I said, this looks like the CIA, and I really feel like I have helped Erdogan get out there and all those people, I go, stop it, CIA, you know, Gulen's doing his thing. And so we, we have to shine light on our own government is the one that's doing all this, right? Um, you have a question? Well, I was just saying, I mean, it seems to me, you're talking, you're, you're vilifying one you know, group of people, you're saying, you know, the Republicans, blah, blah, blah. It seems to me there is a connection, uh, the extreme right and the extreme left. And the, the word fascism could be used very loosely. It's been used and thrown around a lot. But it seems to me once you get into the areas of power and money, uh, it, that's where the right and left come together. And it seems it's not, I mean, if you look at what Nazism, the way, the way uh, Hitler controlled the people, just the way the communists what? did as No, well. no, I, I will. You know, basically it took over your kids, it controlled your life. Okay. So right. there's not that much difference. Okay. Right in the left, the extreme I, I understand. seem to meet at the top where, and then, you know, you talk about the Bilderbergers, they're, they're, they're with the Zionists all, and all the bankers as well. They all meet at the top. Yeah, there's, okay, there's real quick, real quick.
But I do think uh, real quick. The the uh, real, old definition of real, socialism, real, real, real. where the idea of people, uh, you know, the Christ, I don't, you know, Christian socialism, whatever. There is a ideal. I think the Bolsheviks got involved, and actually, the research indicates that that kind of the the extreme right wing kind of planted, you know, the the Bolsheviks. They kind of did, took Lenin and Stalin and made it into a, a kind of fascist-like problem, right? Okay. So it was made into a warring faction, whereas the ideal is no war. Let's just forget the war. You know, if we just, but there, there's always a lot of these bankers, you know, want to keep us at war, right? right? And that's because they make money that way. Divide and conquer. All right, real quick, mm -hmm. yeah. just, a, just a reminder to everybody, and I know some people uh, yeah. are new here, this is questions and answers. Afterwards, we're going to have a rebuttal period, so, right. you know, mm -hmm. Ellen, I'm going to want to try to limit the questions. Okay, the last two questions, and then we'll have the, re the okay. rebuttal. Okay, hand up for an hour. Okay, Charlie. All right, Charlie. Okay, now, as a young intern in Washington, a federal employee, I had heard about the deep state, and I was asking some of the senior officials, I said, I'm just curious where you got your information, because, about all your knowledge, because, I asked around and I said, oh, I heard there's some sort of deep state that's up running this, uh, running Washington. And the guy, no, they didn't answer right away. And then one guy said to me, he says, why do you need to know? <laughs> that's the way well, they I operate. Yeah, that's how they maintain their their power, like authoritarian, you know, is that is, you said who was behind 9-11, but because they don't tell the other one what to do, what they're doing, you know, he was pointing out, Bush probably didn't know, you know, I mean, they're, if you're behind this thing, you're not going to okay. ma make it easy to get it out. Right. It's really best thought of as organized crime, you know, there, it's, you hear about Casa Nostra, I think it's actually NATO, Team B, Gladio was a lead behind armies, planned to be left behind after World War II to, in case the communists took over. And so that, that's where it goes back to um, this little secret lead behind armies that are, we're paying billions of dollars to protect, you know. Um, your final question, well, right? I, 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 Hitler, Hitler blamed the Jewish bankers. Seems like you're doing the same thing. Yeah, that, that's what people say, and I, you know, it's um, I don't, I don't, I don't think just, but it, I'm just investigating, right? You know, I'm not. I, you've got to consider every conspiracy theory, and that, that's actually my best definition of the deep state. Peter Dale Scott. Uh, is a Berkeley professor who's written great books, kind of like David Griffin writes about Pearl, about you know 9/11. He's he's a real respected scholar on the deep state. But he said what he his method, which I follow, is to look at the look at the it's what's not public, and it's okay to look into the conspiracy theories. Okay. We've got to be willing to. Like a scientist has a theory, uh, you got to look, and there there's something going on that I keep looking into with the Wall Street bankers, and uh, you know the fact that the Rothschilds were Jewish is is just a fact, okay. you know. And so the more you look into the Illuminati, there's uh, some problems there. And basically, people will go after you. What's really scary is there's a lot of silencing. You know, call it anti-Semitic, and and that is not what I am. As as my best friend said, I, well, my best friends are Jewish, right? I'm I'm a liberal, just trying to get the corrupt ones out. Wait, she's got one more, Tim. Sure, no uh -huh. problem. Ellen. Yeah, um, I'm wondering. Um, according to the 9/11 Truther movement, do they believe that there needs to be some kind of new technology? Uh, advanced technology that the general public is not aware of in order for it to be the conspiracy that they're talking about, you know, the U.S. conspiracy, um, because I'm just wondering what you think, because that, to me that's preposterous, that they're basing a theory, if they are, on the idea that, that there needs to be some advanced technology that nobody's even 
seen or heard of, yeah, except maybe some high-level government people. Can I help you with that? I've yeah. never heard of that. Yeah, that's a, that, that, I don't know anything about that. So, okay. yeah, Andy yeah. or Jeff. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Uh, quick update on what uh, Alan just asked about 9-11. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, the Pentagon uh, the one thing you need to know is that uh, the Twin Towers went down on 9-11. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
If you want to find out what the communists have to say, you should come to the College of Complexes, because a couple of weeks ago, uh, he was there, and uh, he had this to say. Take a look at this flyer at the back of uh, the uh, room. Uh, I think you'll find it interesting. I think he was an excellent speaker, and everything he had to say, almost everything, is in this flyer. And I was interested in what he said about Russia. He said it was, Russia had, get this, gangster capitalism. Somehow in my head, I saw Russia as still being communist. What? Wake up, Gene. That's me. It's gangster capitalism. Of course, what do we got here in the United States? Gangster capitalism. Gangster capitalism, some would say. The second thing is um, divide and conquer. Anytime you want to see somebody who doesn't have your interests in mind, look for divide and conquer. What's the opposite of that in the part of the solution? The speaker said it, although I'm not sure her idea is the same as mine. But I would use the term community organizing. Because with community organizing, you see people face to face, figure out what they got to say, and you can check with that every time you meet with them. So take a look at that. Another thing is uh, values. If these people had the values that my church claims to have, and I claim to have, maybe we wouldn't have these problems. One is the inherent worth and dignity of every person. No exceptions. Not. No exceptions. If somebody is bad, you figure out why the hell they're bad and work on that and then you can improve society. So th those would be to me uh, two solutions. So, so again, I would suggest that the College of Complexes is not perfect. Perfection is a, a concept. We don't really have it, but I guess it would have been better if the speaker had seen this wonderful write-up that Charles had put it on, on our internet. Thank you. All right. Ted Aranda. For your wonderful presentation. I um, agree very much with uh, many of your sentiments and uh, many of your particular statements. I do have uh, some objections, um, so let me go through some of these things. Um, you said that uh, conspiracy theory was a term invented by the CIA. That's perfectly correct. Uh, they literally, literally invented the, the term in this paper, a document that you can look up, uh, uh, when Kennedy was assassinated by them. They denied it and said, well, you will call those people conspiracy theorists. Um, the, what we have now is, in fact, a war uh, by the rich against the people. And we, in fact, do have tyranny. Okay, nothing uh, short of tyranny. It's a sophisticated kind of tyranny. So it doesn't look it. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, on, on the surface, it's not that obvious, uh, although it's getting more obvious every day. Uh, for instance, we have uh, literally censorship nowadays. Okay, uh, we don't burn books, it's true. But we have Orwellian censorship, Google, uh, Facebook. They're literally taking things offline that they don't like, that they're told not to uh, accept. Um, so let me, uh, and we have to stand up to this tyranny, for sure. Uh, that's what I, I myself, am all about. Um, and you also said that um, you like this free speech forum, which I do as well. I very much appreciate it. And we do have to use this sort of forum to, actually, to do, practice actual democracy. However, this is not democracy. Democracy is a state thing, is a nation thing. It's, it's a country sort of thing. And so we have to expand this sort of interaction and decision making. We don't make decisions. We have to uh, uh, expand the, the discussion 
uh, to, into decision making at, at the state level, using power, okay? Um, that's what democracy uh, would be about. Uh, you said, uh, okay, so you said that um, we need to embrace that we're socialists, anarchists, communists. Uh, I do not embrace, I mean, there's one thing, it's one thing to be on a leftist, somebody who is a crit critical of the current uh, situation. Uh, however, these are distinct things. Socialism, anarchism, democracy are very distinct things, which I, I won't bother to get into right now. I've talked about it before, and this will be a whole other discussion. Um, for instance, communists, excuse me, anarchists deny, essentially, they, they'll, they'll talk around it, but they essentially deny that there has to be a state or government, that there has to be power and a structure of power. That is an absolute fallacy. We have to make, have uh, a government, but it has to be controlled by the people. That's not democracy, and it's not socialism either. Socialism is an, essentially an economic set of policies. So those are very di different things that we have to be clear about. Um, your solutions, you said, <clears throat> well, I have to say I'm sorry that th there were no solutions at all. You said we have to get to the Supreme Court to protect um, communists, to protect our freedoms. They're part of the state. They're part of the tyranny. Okay, the Supreme Court is literally one of the three branches of government. They do not protect the people any more than Congress or the President or anybody else. Okay, uh, it, it's an oligarchical system as a whole, and they're very much part of it. So we have to get rid of the Supreme Court as well as the other branches of government. Um, you said we need uh, a fair media. That's, uh, that was an explicit uh, statement of, of a solution to uh, this problem that we have. That is not a solution. We, that's part of the problem. We don't have a fair media because we don't because we don't control the media. It's a corporate media, and as a matter of fact, it's a CIA-controlled media. It's not just uh, you said it's almost an organ of the CIA. Yeah, it's practically an organ of the CIA. Some of those people, many of those high-level uh, people uh, uh, and uh, anchormen and all them, they are literally con uh, members of and controlled by the CIA, double agents or whatever you want to call them. Um, so, uh, as for one of your answers to the question, one of the questions. Were there actual airplanes uh, in, in, uh, flying into the towers? No, 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 no. There were no more airplanes flying into the towers or crashing into Pennsylvania than I'm Bugs Bunny. And I don't think anybody believes that I'm Bugs Bunny. I'm not the two fairy either. Okay. And I have gone through this in many of my in several of my presentations, which anybody can look up online, especially the last one on 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 9/11. And the Orlando um, hoax, the Orlando shooting hoax. You can look that up specifically. Um, one last thing. Another person um, mentioned that uh, at the top, Nazis and communists, quote unquote, the quote unquote right and the quote unquote left, meet and are essentially uh, the same. And that's to a large degree true historically. <clears throat> the communists, the Russian communists, and the German Nazis were two sides of the same freaking coin. What? They both aspire to, and what all of these people, uh, these monsters, uh, the rulers aspire to, is power over us. If we, this is an oligarchy, a dictatorship. Thanks. Okay. Okay, you got it? Um, I am not a conspiracy denier, and, uh, and I'm not a supporter of the CIA. Waiting on a pen. Um, I think an uh, example of what I'm talking about is Savannah Higgs is a poster child of CIA conspiracies, which has been documented and has happened, and the United States has admitted to it. Uh, the CIA has uh, uh, replaced um, uh, democratically elected leaders uh, in countries like Guatemala, Chile, Iran. Uh, they supported um, uh, Fedayeen in Afghanistan, which uh, built up a power base that kind of ended up biting us in the butt. They supported, uh, well, 9-11. So I am not going to deny conspiracies don't happen, but the uh, idea that all this news footage of the, uh, the news helicopters, the New York news helicopters flying around the building number one on fire and actually filming the second, the second plane flying into the second building and uh, 
I just wonder if you have the courage to walk into New York City and make that statement, because I think you get, I think you get lunch. It's, uh, it, it's just uh, it, to to say that that they were that there were explosions after the planes. That was the initial argument. There were explosions that went off after the planes hit. Seems far fetched, but now I'm starting to hear that the planes didn't even hit the towers. And um, I, I think that people make that argument are passionate. And I think they're well-intentioned because there is a lot of conspiracy going around. There are a lot of people who are trying to use their power to hurt the poor. But I just think that you're hurting the cause. Um, I think the problem is that you have the powerful trying to control the weak, the few powerful trying to control the many weak. Uh, the top six richest people in the United States have as much wealth as the bottom 50%. The 1% are making the rules, and Donald Trump is their cheerleader, and that's what we got to figure out how to attack, and the more you talk about 9-11, the more you give people an excuse to write us off. So I would respectfully ask you to reconsider your position. Thanks. Yeah, my name is Doug Binkley. You all know me as an anti-fascist, so you can probably guess what side of the argument I'm on here. I'm not in favor of any fascists anywhere. You know, maybe they could be sent to Madagascar or something, uh, or Antarctica. But uh, um, Ellen's a good friend of mine. Um, one uh, another friend of mine emailed me and said, "Are you really going to go and see another?" You know, somebody spout off about conspiracy theories. <laughs> Here's the thing. Um, uh, a while ago, there was a conspiracy theory that uh, maybe uh, some of uh, Donald Trump's um, henchmen uh, met with Russians and they colluded. Well, now it's a fact because it's even been admitted. I mean, <laughs> there's proof that uh, Donald Trump Jr. met with uh, some uh, Russian representatives and they um, colluded uh, on some aspect of uh, trying to, uh, uh, well, to get an unfair advantage in the election. Okay, this is this is proof. It's not a conspiracy theory anymore. So. Uh, just using a label of conspiracy theory is a ridiculous thing to do. Uh, it is an attempt at uh, uh, it, something that's um, a fallacy of logic, uh, uh, which uh, I don't remember exactly what it's called, a fallacy of logic, but it's not. Uh, you have to address the facts and you have to address um, the truth of any uh, situation in context, and everyone is different. now. Um, Ellen touched on a whole lot of things uh, in her talk, uh, and uh, one of them was that uh, there are uh, fascists that uh, came over, um, possibly from Germany. There are fascists that are in our government. Uh, uh, they uh, come there from various means. I mean, we know that we elected, or actually, whether it was rigged or not is up for question. That's a whole other thing she, she touched on, too, uh, which would be a good subject for a, a talk tonight if we could get uh, one of these people that's an expert on the uh, election rigging. Uh, but um, um, we have fascists in our government. <laughs> we have to try to root them out and get them out of there. But um, the fact that it goes back to uh, shortly after World War II, uh, well, I mean, and, and before there, then, I mean, no one should be surprised. Um, the question is, uh, um, what exactly did they do? I mean, did they... Um, uh, create, uh, you know, make it happen, let it happen, 9-11. Um, that's uh, another issue that uh, is, has to be decided on the merits of the facts. Um, you know, you have um, this uh, weird Pentagon explosion that a, a witness was uh, uh, reported after the plane hit. Um, you have the interesting fact that a very small hole the plane made. Um, you do have... Um, the missing gold at the bottom of the World Trade Center. People don't bring that up. Maybe it was used to replace some of the gold that was taken out of Fort Knox. So we don't know because we were in the dark about a lot of this. Um, you know, it could have been a twofer. You know, they they uh, uh, replaced some of the gold that they stole. I mean, um, the uh, issue with the uh, um, the plane um, in, in uh, that crashed in Pennsylvania. You're not allowed to see the crash hole. I mean, I went there, interestingly enough, to see the shrine, and of course, you're allowed to see all this garbage that people bring. It's like 
uh, flowers and whatnot and plaques, uh, but you can't get close to the hole. They, they have it roped off. Uh, you can't get within two football fields of it, so who knows? Anyway, um, a lot of these mysteries are kept to keep us guessing. Um, in 9-11, old news, of course, was used to pass the Patriot Act. Um, Ellen didn't touch much on that, but um, we still have the vestiges of that, uh, even though the supposedly they're not recording every cell phone conversation. They can get at your cell phone conversations because the, uh, uh, the actual carriers are, re are storing that information, and it's available from a court order, which you might or might not ever see because, you know, it could be a FISA warrant. At any rate, um, we have uh, this problem of a uh, deep state. I mean, the different people have different ideas about what it entails. Uh, we need a deep throat, I guess, to uh, give us uh, more information. If you, somebody could meet somebody that knows more about it in a, in a, uh, in a, uh, um, a garage, a parking garage would be a great thing, wouldn't it? Um, and uh, one other thing is that, uh, yeah, the CIA might have had two reasons for getting rid of JFK. Um, one of them uh, might have been that he did want to pull us out of Vietnam or not get us started in Vietnam. And another one might have been, which I've talked about before at this college, uh, the UFO uh, thing uh, where they're covering up uh, retrieval of UFO uh, um, uh, engines and uh, whatever, you know, maybe they have cold fusion or whatever that they're trying to hide from the public. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I enjoyed tonight's presentation. It was uh, interesting and stimulating. And I managed to find something on the internet here, which maybe at least uh, Ellen will get a kick out of, uh, on this Betsy McCullough. Spelled, uh, spelled M-C-C-A-U-G-H-E-Y. Assume it's the same one, because she was a, de uh, a lieutenant governor of New York. And uh, Michelle Cottle of The Atlantic has written that she's uh, known for fighting uh, health care plans. She's a member of uh, several conservative think tanks. And uh, she says here that uh, she has a well-earned reputation, and now I'm quoting, across the political spectrum as one of the most dishonest, shameless, and irresponsible conservative thinkers on the scene today. Plus, she's famously narcissistic, self-promoting drama queen. Uh, and she has, she's living a soap operatic career. Apparently she was a candidate for some job in Trump's administration, and she says uh, she would be a glorious fit for Trump's world, but not much uh, for America. So that's Betsy McCoy. Uh, anyway, a little further data on her. Uh, as far as the talk tonight, I agree and disagree with our speaker. Uh, I, just, I, I agree that the wealthy and the powerful run things. Uh, I do not agree that it is any kind of an organized or centrally choreographed uh, conspiracy. I think it's just if you got money and power uh, here or there or everywhere, you can get things done uh, the way you want them. If you don't, it's much, much more difficult. And I disagree with the speaker that was up a few minutes ago that said it's the 1% who run things. It's not the 1%. It's the 1% of 1% who run things. And according to some writers, it's the 2% of 1% of 1% of 1% who run things. It's a very small group. It's not nearly, not nearly as big as 1% of the uh, population. Uh, as a whole. And uh, also a lot of people here seem to think that we can do this, uh, including Gene, I'm much more cynical than he is, we can do this by organizing. Certainly it doesn't hurt to organize, but I think what we need to do is recognize that, that perhaps what we need to do is establish posses and, and just start shooting some Republicans. And then maybe, maybe things will change a little bit. Um, and, uh, Governments and, well not just governments, but corporations, governments, and other people have used uh, basic two basic techniques to keep control of, of the people they want to control. Number one is to keep them fat and happy, or at least give them the perception that they're fat and happy. Or if they're not fat and happy now, but in the future, not too distant, they'll be fat and happy. And the second and perhaps more important issue is fear. So it's keep, keep them fat and happy and keep them scared of something. We had the Soviet Union to, to be fearful of for decades. When they went away, we had to find some new enemies. Now it's Muslims and uh, various other things. But that's, that's the trick. You keep people scared, you keep them under control. Thank you. Well done.
Hi, my name is also Ellen. Um, and I just wanted to say a couple things, um, just kind of taking things in a little bit of a different direction. Um, some of the things that have been disturbed, I mean, I consider myself an independent, but I definitely do lean to the left. Um, but some of the, I feel like, you know, we live in, in a bit of a bubble in terms of our political views, you know, like, I'm always listening to NPR all the time. I listen to Democracy Now! some of the time. I don't re it just so happens that I have a friend who's very conservative and he's reading the alt-right, and which I, you know, I, I very much disagree with the kind of things that he's telling me. But there's, but there are other things that I think he really does have a point on. First of all, it's not just the right that is behaving really badly. You know, the left, is also behaving really badly. Um, there was an old Chicago alderman who wrote, I think in a blog or whatever, he wrote that um, Trump supporters were subhuman puddles of DNA. True. Yeah, he did that. I, I don't want to say who it is right now uh, in case I'm getting the phrase exactly wrong. Um, then also, I, what, what did you say? We know who. Okay, yeah, but a lot of people don't. But he's a Chicago, he's a Democrat. He's supposedly of the Progressive Caucus. Right. Yeah, and um, he, he's doing other bad things as well. Right. Um, but then also, um, sometimes I go to the Northside Democracy for America meetings, which is a left um, group. And there was a woman, I think she had ran for mayor of Bolingbrook, or, and she had lost, and she called the current mayor, she called him a turd. I mean, <laughs> it, it might sound funny, but the truth is we're, we're dehumanizing each other, and you wonder how things like the Holocaust happens when we're going around and thinking that the, the ends are justified by the means all the time. Um, and the other thing that I find really disturbing that my friend often points out, which he, is that the media is doing a really horrible job. And um, I hate to say this, but some of it is, you know, some of these left, I mean the right wing, yeah, Fox News is really bad, but also the left wing side, um, sometimes they, they, they often do not report both sides of an issue. Like, I hate to say this, immigration. Immigration is a complex issue. And, a lot of like NPR, Democracy Now, they only talk about it as, you know, like they kind of give the view almost that we should have open borders and that immigration is all good and these poor immigrants who are being kicked out of the country. And I mean, it's drummed into you over and over and over again. Um, and I'm not, I mean, personal, personally, there are problems with too much immigration. You know, but you never hear about the problems because I happen to know somebody who used to talk about them and he was kicked out of the radio. They wouldn't, they wouldn't voice him. And he's a recent person who was a demographer in the Carter administration. Okay? So it, it's like, I, I think we should have immigration. I think we should take a lot more asylum seekers. We should probably take a little bit less of people who aren't asylum seekers. Um, but, you know, we sh should listen to both sides. We're only listening to one side, most of us. Um, and I think, um, I think one place that you might want to read, if you haven't in the past, is Glenn Greenwald. Um, he's been a media critic for a very long time. Is that the buzzer saying? My time is up. Um, okay. And I just want to say, I feel like, in a way, there is a kind of a lot of censorship in the media. If you've ever heard of Greg Palast, who works at, he's a journalist who works out of um, the UK, and that's because they wouldn't allow him to speak, you know, to really publish well anymore in the US, in the US, because he was too controversial. And there's also, um, I just was hearing yesterday, actually this was on PR, there was a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist um, from the New York Times, and he got, there was an Iran story, and they refused to publish it. 
And then, and then he got prosecuted for the government because he wrote a book about it, about that and other issues. But um, there's a lot of censorship going on in the media. Okay, thank you. And self-censorship as well. Thank you. <laughs> Hey, yeah, there's uh, no question the media is doing a horrible job. It's a uh, concentration of money and power in Wall Street. Uh, very good speech. It's good to see somebody going into, uh, into the deep state of politics uh, and uh, drilling down farther and farther and uh, helping our understanding. Uh, I'm lobbying for uh, a speech for doing something on Wall Street so we can follow the money better. It all, it all comes from Wall Street, basically. Uh, I know one thing, 9-11 made a lot of money for Wall Street and a lot of some companies, so it was very good, uh, very good business, the 9-11 affair. Um, so going back to Wall Street again, um, you know, it's unfortunate that um, Trump gave the um, this tax cut to basically Wall Street in the 1%. Um, and you know, uh, limousine liberals like Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton are not off the hook either. Uh, you know, Obama gave way, he got tricked and gave way too much money to Wall Street. It was in the trillions of dollars. So, um, you know, they're just as bad. The Lindsay liberals are just as bad as the uh, uh, Republicans in a lot of respects, Hillary and Barack. So, um, who, who here thinks that the, the super high uh, bubble Wall Street Dow, Dow average is, a, is, is good for the economy? I think so. Yeah. In the short run, until it goes down. Right. <laughs> so the bubble bot hops. Um, it's really no indication. At all. I mean, it's good for portfolio holders and the one percent, the point one percent, and you know, Wall Street, and you know, and uh, Wall Street companies. But generally, it is no indication of the economy at all. It's, uh, in fact. <clears throat> Things that are good for middle America are bad for Wall Street. Things that are good for Wall Street are bad for middle America. Higher wages are bad for Wall Street. Uh, better jobs are bad for Wall Street. More, more uh, protections and regulations are bad for Wall Street. Um, more wars are good for Wall Street. <laughs> so uh, Wall Street's not your, your friend, my friends. OK, thanks. Our next rebutter, please. All right, we got a, we got we got an open mic. We need another rebutter up there. Mr. Barton, get up there, please. Uh, the warning signs of fascism and some are powerful and continuing nationalism, disdain for human rights, identification of enemies as a unifying cause, supremacy of the military, rampant misogyny, control of mass media, obsession with national security, religion and government intertwined, corporate power protected, labor power suppressed, disdain for intellectuals and artists, Obsession with crime and punishment, rampant cronyism and corruption, fraudulent elections, denial that pollution is real, especially climate change pollution, and absolute lack of respect for human rights, especially disability rights, independent living services, and community accessibility programs. In the Eastern Bloc Soviet countries in the 1980s, uh, there were 45 surveillance and law enforcement officials to every one citizen who wasn't on the government payroll uh, to basically uh, eliminate all privacy and all liberty of the citizenry. Um, that's not just a statistic to my family because we actually lived in West Germany in the 1980s and we were able to go to the border of West Germany and East Germany uh, the northern sea uh, beach one day and see the massive amounts of money that was spent on the gates and the barbed wire and the fences and uh, the lookout towers. Um, 
What's the ratio in the USA in 2018 with DHS, FBI, and CAA? I'll let you figure out the answer to that question because it's a daunting question for me to ask. The, vote, the vetting process in the United States. Uh, what kind of times are we living in when uh, a Clinton or a Trump is an actual choice that then uh, anyone with a uh, sense of history would say those two people are qualified. Uh, those are two of the biggest uh, advocates of violence we've ever known in our country. The other day I was at the library, I tried to get a Noam Chomsky video on the computer when I used DuckDuckGo and it said on the screen you can't watch a Noam Chomsky video when you do DuckDuckGo, you have to use Google. That's a big F you to the First Amendment from the deep state whether we realize it or not. No, they don't want you to have privacy when you're reading. Because your reading is a threat to their greed and their violence and their pollution and their oligarchy and their plutocracy and their imperialism. It's just the video happened to be of the world's most cited living author, that's all. Uh, we need more public spaces uh, for uh, the public to have dialogues about civics. The liquor stores are open 24-7, the casinos are open 24-7, the ATMs are open 24-7. That's part of the system that we're facing. Uh, I love the College of Complexes, but I would respectfully say, this isn't really the College of Complexes that Slim Brundage dreamed of. There were no money limits. There were no time limits. There was no time to quickly get out of the building. <laughs> well, they actually yeah, knew that, that. The, 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 the civilization we live in and or we don't live in, we think we live in and we dream of, depended on public meeting spaces and civic discussions all the time, not just once a year for feel good. Uh, failed state. What is the definition of uh, the people of a failed state? Well, that's another question I ask all of you tonight. Uh, President Jimmy Carter talked about Citizens United Supreme Court decision recently in an interview. I don't have time to read it in my rebuttal, but I brought it if anybody wants to read it. Um, just something really minor. I don't know if anybody thinks this is important or not, but when I go to my local bus stop, I don't have a bench. Can't sit down. My, both of my grandfathers served in World War II. They weren't in the line of fire, but they did serve they can't even sit down at their local bus stop bench. That's our infrastructure. That's the foundation for everything else. To get on a bus to go here tonight, you got to get on the bus. There has to be a sidewalk there and a bench. It has to be an actual acknowledgement that we're human beings and not robots. Uh, to finish, I'll just read this brief poem. We are where the you are here sign used to stand. The hour of reckoning erased right off the map. A crowd of bread and circuses and wild price tags we are living in a house built on sand. <coughs> Donnie and Mikey, we pray for the USA each and every day, but we ain't gonna take your place when it comes time to walk the plank. There's a court calling your regime, and its name is The Hague. It's time for we the people to lead, so get the DC out of our way. Thank you. All right. I'm gonna go do my political one. All right. All right, Charlie. Let's see. I, you guys are forcing me to. Yeah. All right. Let's, first of all, let's thank our speaker. Thank you, Ellen. By the way, she posted that article. I just forwarded it on to you. All right. Let's see. I got a number of things I have to get over here. Right. I'll be eclectic as usual. Uh, regarding 9-11, you come along and you find a pile of rubble and then you make up all sorts of theories about how at one time that was a, a structure or so of some significance and how it became a pile of rubble and you're supposed to be differentiated among all the explanations. Um, well, my best of luck to you in that endeavor if that's your approach, you know, and that's how you end up with some sort of science fiction stories or explanations as Ellen was talking about uh, the military has this weaponry or uh, a new type of explosive but what you're lacking in and let me tell you I don't know if I can convey this to you I got a call to assist an attorney in representing an employee and 
I said, I'll see what I can do. There was an incident that they're accused of and so forth. Uh, I called back to her and told her later, and I have, I have six witnesses who are willing to testify and make depositions in whom you can cross-examination. Now, after 15 years or 17 years, you have no one you can produce as a witness, a participant, or someone whom we can cross-examine to ascertain the truth. I suggest you do that first, otherwise I don't know what direction you're in. The other thing about CTA, it's been brought up at CTA meetings about seating and shelters. Some aldermen don't want seats and so forth because they, they got bums and, and also there's complaints about guys selling drugs in the hood. If you come to my neighborhood, they have called the sacks and fountains and things, but there's no benches in those little areas because the guys were using it as little storefronts and things like that. I don't know why it did, but you pick whatever you want about that. There's even been arguments about the design of those shelters. So, yeah, I have been thought about. Yeah, it does, uh, but no, the the seniors do talk about that. Uh, regarding the deep state. Um, you know, I I don't know how to say this. I, I I lived in a small town, and for a number of years, and then I was invited to join a group, and then it finally occurred to me when I was in that group, a very small select group within this community, uh, several thousand people, it was really somewhat isolated. I realized that I was a member of the deep state. That <laughs> they had invited me and had found me worthy. I had been brought to this meeting, dinner, we had dinner and things like that. And, you know, and this is how it operates. There's a deep state, there's a deep state within organizations. See, Helen kept saying, well, there's a they or something. Oh, wait a minute, there's no they. It very well exists and you better find out who's in the deep state and how it operates if you wish to succeed. And so it operates within government. It's a small community, at whatever scale you at. Um, there's even a book about this many years ago called Babbitt, which he talks about getting into the deep state, so to speak. They didn't use that terminology, you know. Uh, and yeah, these reformers. Well, reformers are never going to get into deep state. I can assure you that. And these anti-government types, they they're kind of on the fringe too, so they're not going to be there. Uh, some of the people like Hillary, uh, Hillary was in the deep state, uh, and and this this guy we got, he's not. That's his problem, and he ain't never going to be be in it. Now, what do I mean by a deep state? Is that um, many years ago, I, I I was put in charge of my union for the first time, and I said, well, how do I organize or how do I do this? an organized, organized labor movement. And then I actually did this. I said, well, we're going to style it like the resistance or underground movements during the war. And that's how we did it. And there's things, I actually did do this. You've read one of my books, The Force More Powerful. There's other books called The Soldiers of the Night and the Commies, especially yeah, Chairman Mao knew how to do this. And you form your own deep state. That's what they were fearful of that you had your own deep state operating that they could not control. That was our goal. Now, the way we used to do it is, I used to visit a coworker. Let's say I was visiting you and talking with you, and we'd be chit-chatting at a cubicle, and I'd look over this way, and I'd look over that way, and I'd say, union meeting tonight, spread the word. That's how you do it. But. <laughs> But it is an underground movement. Are you, you cut me off? We got time to this. Have my extra time. No, I'm done anyway. Anyhow, you did very good. And uh, yeah, if anybody wants that article, uh, we do have a Yahoo group. That's who I send it out on. So I recommend you sign up uh, and and get on it for notices and like that. By the way, February 17th has been changed. Uh, we're having that candidate for the commissioner. And we're not going to do the presidential thing, we'll do that another time. Thank you, Andy, for helping out. Oh, yeah, I'm All right, it was a good job. You're going to give me our time, though.
Yeah, he's going to tell me about 9-11. Yeah, a quick one. Well, the reason people talk about 9-11 is what Professor Griffin said in his last book, his 12th book on the subject, uh, three quarters of it. The book is titled Bush and Cheney, How They Ruined America and the World. And uh, three quarters of the book is about all the disastrous things that the Bush Cheney administration and the others did because we were attacked by 9-11. After that, he doesn't talk about 9-11 much in the first three quarters. And at the end of the book, he lists 15 miracles. He said you have to believe in miracles, basically like the Tooth Fairy and Santa Claus, in order to <coughs> keep believing the only conspiracy theory that matters is the official story. And um, we have one person uh, that has what we call a Catholic Church Syndrome. Uh, if you go into a Catholic Church on Sunday and say, oh, by the way, Father O'Malley's been abusing your kids, half the congregation will say, well, you're slandering the man, so I'm not going to look at any evidence. That can't be true, so I won't look at the evidence. The other half of the congregation says, if a shred of this is true, we have a legal, moral, and ethical obligation to look at the evidence. And for the two people that left, and maybe more, what they're saying to the world is, uh, on 9-11, look at me, I'm dumber than a fifth grader, and I'm proud of it. Because you only need, as Professor Griffin said, you need a seventh, Charlie, how are you guys doing back there? You uh, need a seventh grade education and a 30% open mind. You don't even need an open mind to understand the facts of 9-11. The handout I handed out earlier is uh, the summary of Griffin's 12 books. Okay. I have Xerox copies of two other handouts. One of them is a summary, it's a six-page summary of a book <coughs> written by Edward Hendricks. Henry, I'm sorry. It's called 9-11, Enemies, Foreign and Domestic. <coughs> and the, <coughs> the other article, this article showed up on the Smirking Chimney uh, in August. But can we have a little quiet back there while the people are trying to hear? What really happened on 9-11? A whistleblower comes forward. Charlie would like this one because whistleblowers that were involved in 9-11 now are coming forward and talking about how it was done and who did it. 9-11 was created to be our new Pearl Harbor to motivate our Congress and the American people to accept a huge rightward turn with the United States being converted into basically a police state. The Patriot Act and the Military Commissions Act and the other things that have been passed since 9-11 give the authorities the ability to grab anybody off the street and send them to a foreign jail with no phone call. We have no rights if they deem us a uh, threat to national security. And of course, they don't need any proof to do that. So we pump through that one myth, as Professor Griffin said, we won't get our country back until we publicly disavow the myth of 9-11 and recognize that everything we were told about that day is a total, complete fairy tale. He said, to believe, to believe that the towers were damaged by the plane crashes, you have to believe in miracles. The tower was just sitting there and all of a sudden, poof, it just collapsed. But it didn't collapse. It was converted to dust in seconds before anything hit the ground by massive explosives and rolled over lower Manhattan as a cloud of dust. Each, each tower left its area and was dust in the wind. Incidentally, uh, you should all be familiar with the fact that there were seven buildings that were demolished by explosives that day. Some demolition company was given the contract to uh, prep all seven obsolete buildings for demolition. Media filmed the first two and said we were attacked by 19 crazy Muslims. Many authors have said basically, if we wanted to take over the oil fields off of Norway and invade that area and just take their oil, we would have been attacked by 19 crazed Norwegians. <laughs> if we were going to take over gold mines in Spain or someplace else, we would have been attacked by 19 crazed Spaniards. It's a false flag operation. You have to kill a bunch of your own people in broad daylight to create a tremendous <laughs> hatred in the public for whoever was that attacked us and then you blame it on the country you want to invade. Charlie had a question? How do you set charges for seven buildings of pretty size of significance and no one 
notices it? <laughs> uh, Charlie's got a good question. The reason nobody noticed it was uh, there was a, a security company headed up by uh, one of the Bush people that had control of the security of the Twin Towers, uh, of, of the World Trade Center. They took over security since 1995, and they were running a program in the towers with uh, a, a group of Israeli art students that were doing something. Um, but they, you know, the people that, towers were three quarters empty. They were losing money, white elephants, and they were scheduled, the whole complex was scheduled for demolition five years earlier than 9-11, but they couldn't figure out how to do it without being sued for spreading asbestos dust all over Lower Manhattan. So they got the idea, let's take out billions of dollars worth of terrorist insurance on the buildings, and we'll film it, we'll have our friends in the media, which were fully complicit. These articles make the case that the media was fully complicit in selling us the story of 9-11. It was a scripted event. Without the media, if they had investigative reporters like we used to have in the past, the whole thing would have been transparently conspiracy, uh, transparently ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Ted. A number of people noticed that the towers were shut down, power was shut down uh, in the middle of the night. Strange trucks were coming and bringing in some oh. stuff. Oh, yeah. Material. For people for, didn't notice. for a couple of weeks prior, a couple weekends prior in the days, the, uh, all the power was shut down, so there was no security uh, throughout the towers, uh, and the electricity was shut off. They had a power down while they were doing something, you know, renovating the cable and the elevators. Or, there's various stories, but to know that the towers were packed with explosives, all you have to do is look at the video. As many different physicists have said, when you see the evidence of massive explosions and you see the dust cloud rolling in the wind sideways, you know that massive explosives were packed in there. And also, if you look at the film, you just log on to Architects and Engineers or uh, any of the 9-11 truth sites. Architects and Engineers is one of the best. They have a lot of good videos. But um, what they show, there's, there's video by uh, many independent people showing the layers of explosives going off in the towers, starting from the top down. Uh, and the firefighters said that too in the oral history. They watched the survivors, they watched the layers of explosives going off all the way down to make it look like the buildings were collapsing, like they were falling. What was going through the air was the waves of explosives starting at the top down. So it's a little faster than gravity, so the, the, the towers were completed and converted to dust. A lot of the steel and virtually all the concrete was dustified before anything hit the ground. And that's, that's a basic fact. That's not debatable in any scientific forum whatsoever. That's one fact that's agreed upon by people all over the world. Charlie again? All right, let's... They, wait a minute. There's a, a building maintenance, building managers, HVAC, guys on duty 24 hours, 24-7, custodials, carpenters, electricians in buildings. So you're telling me a crew did seven buildings over a period of seven weeks, and you have yet to produce, except one guy who wrote a book, the chairman of the that, that organization, is unable to produce even one person to testify about no one has come up with a tell-all. Well, a tell-all book. We're still only well. The tell-all book about what happened is in the books that have already been published. A participant. There's you don't. You don't. You don't need a participant yes. of a murder to tell to see that a murder was committed. Once you see the evidence of a murder, then you have an investigation to try to find who did it. That's circular reasoning, totally fallacious reasoning to say, no, oh, we got to murder a body and everything else, and unless the guy that shot this person comes forward, we're not going to investigate. Okay. Okay? It's so we have to stop thinking that way. Yeah. It's, 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 it's fallacious and erroneous. And the Atillo is a confession. I know. Yeah, but but you know, a lot of times you don't, you don't get, you don't you don't get to, Charlie, quit messing up our talks like this. You've, you've been doing this for five years, and it, it's it's showing offensive ignorance. That's what this is. It's the same thing as what the people denied that the pedophile priests were abusing kids. They had more and more kids get damaged and everything because people wouldn't step through the psychological barrier and face the reality. You've got to step through the barrier and face the reality. Thank you. <laughs> Incidentally, there's two other articles here. Does anybody want these? Yeah, I'll take one. Here is a set of murder. I guess I'm a fifth grader. And I guess I don't know what I'm doing. Because I believe the 9-11 Commission report. 
I believe the two hijackers. I believe the two hijackers was easier to take down the buildings, and what you describe as explosives was basically Whoa. aluminum and jet fuel mixing together. What they don't tell you is that aluminum does explode at certain temperatures, and with the amount of aluminum on those aircraft and a lot of the evidence that I'm looking at, I'm finding what you're talking about is a bunch of poppycock. I mean, I'm sorry, but I've been looking at this more and more, and I'm getting more and more convinced of the government, of the government um, official story. And frankly, I'm getting a little bit more upset that you can't see the facts like I do. And I'm actually trying to, to come through it, you know. I mean, I didn't arrive by my views on nuclear power by, by not uh, looking at the issues and the evidence. But what I am saying is that I've started the process about what you recommended, and I'm finding that a lot of the stuff you're citing just doesn't jive with reality. My apologies, Andy, but I, I am disagreeing with you. And I'm not denigrating your character at all by this. I'm just saying when I look at that same evidence, I come to a completely different conclusion. I believe that it was Al-Qaeda that brought down those buildings. It was a rehearsed operation through Al-Qaeda. They knew how to do it. And they did it for less than $150,000, which is basically the cost of getting a plane ticket, the, the evidence that they got flight lessons, the other things that in there. and. Plus, with the news footage that was taken with 9-11, and yes, you can explain the quote-unquote pancake effect of the sausage, of the downed buildings and everything else. And yes, I'm aware that there are seven buildings that went down at the World Trade Center. Probably a lot more than what you realize. However, that, as Charlie says, you know, you have eyewitnesses. You have people come forward to tell the truth. What I've seen with a lot of these 9-11 conspiracy theorists is a bunch of stringing together of a bunch of disparate evidence that doesn't jive. Versus, like, even if you read the 9-11 Commission report, that first third of the book reads like a, a, a thriller novel. It, it reads he like... believes the government. You know, I believe the government on this. But it does, it, it was a well-written, well, well book. And if anybody really wants to know, read Andy's books and then read the report. I'm doing both of that now. Hopefully I'll be able to get in some very firm conclusions in the next few months so I can counter what you've been talking about for so long. But anyway, I do appreciate you coming up here and talking about this stuff. But again, I simply can't believe the conspiracy because you're talking thousands and thousands of people and nobody's come forth yet with the smoking gun. Nobody, it's just still a bunch of authors trying to make a, a something out of nothing. A number of people have been killed. Well, Ted, you know, we're, you know, like I said, I'm not going to claim that I know a lot about it yet, but believe me, I will know a lot more soon. And the more I look, the more I'm believing the government. Wow. Okay. 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 okay, our speaker gets the last word, I guess. And unless anybody else wants to go on the bottom. Why did it take seven years to clean up that site? Because of a lot of it was a lot of money. Yeah. 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 All right, you got the last word. Okay. Yeah, Let's, uh, so, um, I'm going to go over the last word. Yeah, last word. Yeah, last word. Yeah, okay. I agree. Um, Obviously, that uh, I've done a lot of research, and one of the things that convinced me was seeing that Building 7 come down, uh, you know, and nothing hit it. Um, you know, it, you got to look at the evidence. I, I, there's this great 9-11 10 years after my guy Peter Dale Scott was on the jury, and um, it really is like a great trial where they, it's, it was set in Canada, which is interesting because they didn't have a fair analysis of here. You don't. You, they didn't do a an investigation. That's that's the smoking gun, if you ask me. That you know the I've got the the 9/11 Commission report, just like the Warren report uh, and the 
the report on the assassinations they did after that and the church commission, you know, that these things are, um, they're jokes, just like this, uh, you know, this Paris or whatever, the um, Russian thing. It, it, they, the Lawrence Walsh who investigated, I guess, Iran Contra, said you've got to, you know, there has to be an investigator that's got the power to get the evidence. He has to ask for it. He has to put them on the witness stand. And um, that's what we don't have. That's, that's the Carl Schmidt effect that I'm concerned about. There's, we actually, police are not trained to investigate. It's like they're, I looked at, you know, how do you become a policeman? Uh, they, you know, they have to be a SWAT team. I said, could I be a policeman? They go, no, uh-uh, we only take SWAT teams. You know, they, they are actively, our government, you know, is a run like a Gestapo, and they, they're not allowed to investigate. That, that's why my understanding, Charlie works for the FBI, right? Making sure that those police are gagged, and they don't get to say anything. And if they do, they get called out, and they got Charlie to defend them. Right? This is the problem. There's no, uh, right, Charlie? Isn't that what you told me? Right? You know, he's like, do you work for the FBI? I'm like, no, do you? He goes, yeah, that's what I do. You know, I defend gag police. They're not allowed to tell the truth. Right? They're not allowed. How, why don't they come forward? It's in the contract. You don't get to tell the truth. I went to one of these things. I went up to all the policemen with their little, I go, why aren't you telling the truth about stuff? And they're like, we're not allowed to, right? Now they're, they don't even have to wear their little cameras anymore, right? Because, they, you know, that, that would make it awkward for them, you know, right? They, all their friends asking them, why are you not telling the truth, right? This is the thing. There is a conspiracy of lying. That's the big conspiracy. The big lie, as Hitler said, is easier than the little lies, right? The big lies were very easy to pull off, especially if you have the media. And the media has been complicit. That's one thing you know is they talked about 9-11 as the seven, building seven went down, the newscaster, it was in the background, right? They announced 9-11, you know, and it hadn't happened yet. In Chile, they announced a coup and it hadn't happened yet. I mean, they really are a part of this. It, it's called psychological operations. That's the way the CIA was formed, right? They, they are using the media to drive the narrative, right? They're to cover it up and pull off wars and get us into war and, and rationalize war and not get to the truth. So that is, um, and they, Carl Schmidt gave them the right to do it. That's the scary thing. Our Federalist Society our Scalia, all right-wing Republican people. Right now, the only judges that are being put in judgeships for life are come from this Federalist Society, which is a CIA operation, right? So our judges are being planted by the Nazi secret police. And these are not just Nazi in philosophy. These are Nazis, Barbie, Eichmann, you know, these are the ones that were brought over by us and put into Argentina and, and all through our own government. Reinhard Gellin was the number one head of intelligence and we gave him millions of dollars to orchestrate the Iran coup and all the torture in Chile. You know, I mean, if you care about us torturing, smashing people's hands, killing and murdering people, you better start waking up. That's what we're doing, right? This isn't just about politics. This is about murder. You know, this is the evilest form of evil there is. We've got to start talking about it. Okay. Thank you. Give a little out, Andy. Lively debate is over. Thank you all for coming tonight, and we will see you next Saturday. And we're out for this Saturday. Thank you. Thank you.